If you have ever owned a slave, please raise your hand. And there's not one hand going up anywhere in this theater. Slavery is not our fault. We didn't do it. We didn't cause it. It's not our responsibility, but it is our shared history. And when we try and turn it into something that it's not, when we try and make more light of it than it was, then we are denying who we really are and we are impeding our ability to truly move forward as a community or as a nation. We're at the Lorraine Motel, and right outside room 306, there is a wreath, which is approximately where Dr. King was standing when he was shot down. And if you look across the street, there's a building over there from where the shots were fired. It was a shot that almost couldn't miss. Exactly one week before Dr. King was shot, there was a demonstration here in downtown Memphis to support striking sanitation workers. And my dad took my older brother and I to that demonstration. It broke into violence. And my dad told us to run. It's difficult to think about now because there was a young black teenager named Larry Payne who lost his life that day. He encountered a police officer and was killed. And it's just one of those events in my childhood that made me realize how lucky I was, uh, how lucky I was not to end up like Larry Payne, and how lucky I was to have come out of Memphis in the way that I did. until the end. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. We've got to see it through. Tonight, Jeff Robinson will tell us stories that we've not heard, stories that we think we know, but have not wrestled with their meaning yet. The story of us. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Jeff Robinson. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, y'all. I was 11 years old in 1968. And to my young eyes, we had been on a path toward racial justice that was amazing. There was the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. We were winning on buses and at lunch counters. We were seemingly, to me, at a tipping point where we were either going to roll forward with this incredible momentum on racial justice or we could roll back. And then April 4th happened and King got shot in the neck, and it felt like the whole thing just rolled back. Because then came Richard Nixon and the war on drugs. We're 50 years later now, and once again, young activists in America are making Americans take a look in the mirror in terms of our true history of race and racial prejudice. Once again, the young activists are calling us to account. Once again, America is having to look at issues of race dead in the eye. And once again, we are at a tipping point. And the question for all of us in this room is, what are we going to do about it? We are our own worst enemies when it comes to making true racial progress in America. And unless we are willing to take a long and hard look in the mirror, 
This concept of taking two steps forward and three steps backward is where we are going to continue moving in this country. In 2011, my wife and I became parents. My sister-in-law, who lived here in Queens, passed away, and we became the parents of her then 13-year-old son. And if you ask Matthew Liam Brooks, what are you? He will tell you, I'm Puerto Rican, Taino, Indian, and African American. And he's very proud of that. And when I look at him, I say, I understand, dude, but you're a young black male, because that's what America is going to see. And all of a sudden, the surface skimming that I felt like I had been doing about on the history of race and what racism meant in America, it wasn't enough. And so I started reading more. And I found myself getting angry and feeling ignorant. I went to Marquette University, and I graduated from Harvard Law School. I've had one of the best educations in America, and I started learning stuff about the history of race in this country that I had never heard before. And I thought, how could I not have known this? How could I not have been taught this? And I started thinking, if I don't know this, I wonder how many other people don't know. Slavery had nothing to do with the war. That was not the cause of the southern states seceding. That was not the cause of the first shot being fired on that fort over there. It was about money. And it was not about slavery. It was about moral tariffs. It was about more money. Lincoln wanted to impose 45% more taxes on the southern states. Taxes on the goods the southern states were producing. And those goods were essentially cotton, tobacco, and rice. Predominantly. And those goods were produced by slave labor. All of it. Is that, isn't that right? Not all of it. I mean, 95% of it? Isn't that right? If it's 95% produced by slave labor, enslaved people, and the North is saying, we're going to tax you on that because we want some of that money. And the South is saying, no, wait a minute, we're the ones producing it, so you shouldn't be taking the money. That money wouldn't exist without slave labor. I mean, that, that did in fact the affect the bottom line. Wouldn't you agree with that? They chose to stay. In most cases in the South, that's the way it worked, because they were treated as family. And they knew what they had. They didn't know what they were being faced with if they left. So your view is that enslaved people were treated as family? then why wouldn't it be all right for me to own you as long as I treated you like family? If that's the way economics work. Would you be satisfied with that? In today's world. In any world. In today's time. In any time. Yeah. So was slavery evil? Yes. I'm not denying it. And this flag has nothing to do with that. No. This is a soldier's battle flag. I think I need to, I'm, I'm, I'm a little sick today, and so I'm just standing in the heat. Uh, thank you for talking to me, I will say that. I, 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 I appreciate that. Thank you very much for yes, talking sir. to me.